God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Thank you, brother, so much, and so grateful for Steve, and uh, echo uh, the thoughts by Tom, and uh, certainly grateful not only for this lesson, but almost all of the lessons, the songs that are sung are uh, chosen in a way that reflects what it is we're focused on and studying and grateful for that, grateful for singing. And I was just thinking as we were going through the class how uh, we have polishing the pulpit. I don't know if we have polishing the songbook. Uh, maybe maybe something like that exists today, but uh, at least as a, at a local level, uh, we are engaged in that, which I think is helpful. Um, just like anything else, without continuously being focused on it and reverting back to those basic principles, uh, it's pretty easy and quick to get away from uh, what's best practice. And for those of you who not only can carry a tune, but uh, can distinguish others who aren't as good at carrying a tune, I'm sure you're grateful for these kinds of classes. And uh, although I can't necessarily hear the way that those who are skilled in this area can hear, uh, I'm grateful for them to just be reminded of some basics and uh, so grateful for our Father giving us the pattern that He has given us uh, because it is a huge way that is singing uh, in, in developing our uh, spiritual senses, in developing our service to Him, uh, and improving our own health from a spiritual perspective. Uh, you just think about all the uh, mental and emotional benefits that come with singing and to be able to focus in on it and to get better at it, uh, it's going to make us better fathers, it's going to make us better grandfathers, uh, better mothers, better grandmothers, better servants uh, in the kingdom holistically. And uh, what a blessing it is to be able to sing. Um, we have been studying and looking at uh, the pre-existent one here this week as we've been going through our text, looking at his life. Remember, we're just we're doing an introduction here to Jesus and the work that he did in terms of his ministry. We're going to be doing an introduction for several more weeks, actually, because in order to do an introduction on the life of Christ, uh, you don't start with his actual work here on earth as the second member of the Godhead was walking amongst mankind. You have to begin with who he is in terms of his nature, him being deity. And then as we'll look and begin to transition, we're going to see Jesus throughout the Old Testament. And in actuality, as it's been said before, uh, the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. The Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. And so some might scratch their head and say, wait a second, Jesus in the Old Testament? Absolutely, Jesus in the Old Testament. And so uh, we're really going to be spending several weeks just getting to the point of really setting the stage for, quote, his life as we think about it in terms of his work in, in ministry here upon the earth, uh, but we're really just introducing who he is regarding his nature and, um, and his being. And in that introduction, and as we consider that, obviously it's not going to be exactly chronological. We're going to go back and forth in terms of what he has already done in terms of the gospel uh, and the benefits that come to you and I because of that. And that's really what we're looking at this afternoon. We're really focusing in, as Dale Jenkins points out here for us in this lesson, the fact that Jesus is still actively alive and engaged and uh, not only participating, but leading us in terms of our work and the care that he has for us, which, as Steve mentioned prior to that song we just sang, I mean, that's kind of the thought and idea behind this very lesson as we just sang those words. He cares and loves us and is uh, interceding for us as we're going to look throughout our study this afternoon. So let's begin as we think about authority. Remember, we looked at authority this morning, and as we now kind of transition uh, let's think about for just a second regarding the pre-existence uh, aspect of who he is and his timeline is infinite. And that's relevant when we think about him from an authoritative perspective. Authoritative figures sometimes are mission-centered. What do I mean by mission-centered? Well, there's a certain objective. There's a certain outcome that's seeking to be achieved. And we tend to kind of say it this way, uh, the ends justify the means. And so in other words, because there's some kind of outcome I'm seeking to achieve, I'm going to kind of put everything else aside, doesn't matter what I do, and I'm going to get it done because the end that I'm seeking to achieve will then 
allow me to get to that outcome, and that outcome is the, the important aspect of what it is I'm trying to do, or whatever it is this authoritative figure is trying to do. But not the case with Jesus. Why? Well, because his pre-existence means his timeline is infinite, and so there is no end in terms of uh, his work. His work is continual. It continues even to this very day. And think about this comparative to other authoritative figures who are mission-minded. Think about it from a political perspective, right? Political parties and political candidates, hey, they're going to come around, they're going to knock your door, they're going to give you text messages and phone calls and engage and find out what it is they can do to gain your vote. And then it seems like right after that vote is gained, where do they go? Well, you kind of don't hear from them again until maybe another two years if they're a representative, six years if they're a senator, or four years if they're running for uh, presidential office. And so typically, again, that mission-centered mindset means work, 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 and then once I finally achieve that objective, okay, finally I can rest. I don't have to deal with these, you know, simpletons any longer. Think about it from a boss perspective. A boss may support you as an employee. They might be engaged with you. They might really care about who you are and what you're involved in and trying to support you and your efforts and your goals. And then all of a sudden, they get promoted, still within the same company, still able to email you, still able to call you, talk to you, text you, whatever. But now that they've been promoted, oh, wait, you're not uh, useful to me any longer. There's no longer a need for me to engage with you because you no longer are connected to my evaluation to then get to the next run in the ladder, and so uh, therefore I've achieved my mission. Think about it from a parent or a guardian perspective. Hannah and I know a family. It's a sad situation. It's a guardianship situation, uh, however, still family-related, blood-related, and the child, the young person, was being brought up, and the guardians basically said something to the effect of, you know, we can't really wait to wash our hands and just be done with this altogether, and finally, they're out of the nest, and we're just Basically, the person's just likened unto a stranger to us from that point forward. And that's exactly, unfortunately, what they did. Rather than transitioning to a new stage and a new season in that relationship, the idea and the thought was, oh, finally, the dreadful days of parenting and being under our roof are over, and now I don't even know who you are anymore. Sometimes parents act that way. So, again, less likely with the parent situation, but authoritative figures are sometimes mission-centered. Not so with Christ. His mission is continual. And go back there with me in Hebrews chapter 7 and in verse 25, and Brother Jenkins points this out. Hey, we could spend a lot of time regarding the phrase there, able to save to the uttermost, completely or forever. In other words, it is 100% foolproof what he is able to do. Uh, we could spend a, a lot of time just thinking about that in terms of especially uh, the offense and enemy status that we are against God, Romans chapter 8, as it relates to uh, the issue and problem that we have regarding sin. Jesus is able to actually take care of that. That in and of itself is a lesson. But then go on here and it states that he always lives to make intercession for them. Jesus is still actively engaged and working. That word intercession in the Greek, entonkeno, which means to make petition, to make petition. And here's the uh, benefit and the thought for us. Go with me to Romans chapter 3, Romans chapter 3, and think with me of our status. And we're going to stay here for two major verses. You can put your marker there. Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of of God. We then know Romans chapter 6 and verse 23 that the wages of sin is death. And then if you go over to Revelation chapter 12, Revelation chapter 12 and look with me there in verse 10, notice the work of Satan. What is it that he is focused on and engaged in? The accuser of our brethren, the end part there in verse 10, who accuses them before our God day and night. And so what's our situation? Our situation is all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every accountable person has fallen and is in a status that is deserving of death, Romans 3.23, 6.23, and that the evil one is the accuser, not just accusing once. Think about Job, for example, and what Satan did in that situation, trying to 
make accusations against Job and of God in that context. Uh, but day and night, Revelation chapter 12, Revelation chapter 12 and verse 10. And so uh, what kind of situation are we in? We are in a situation where we are in desperate need of one who is going to take care of of this problem for us. And we go back to Romans 3 now. Remember I said place your marker there. Go back to Romans 3 and look there at verse 25. Whom God set forth as a propitiation by His blood through faith to demonstrate His righteousness because in His forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. And so uh, we are in an enemy state against Almighty God. Our sins have yielded us a status where we have fallen short of His glory. We are deserving of death. We have the accuser who is casting accusations in our direction day and night. But Jesus and His blood satisfies the wrath of God. Remember, propitiation, the satisfaction of wrath, appeasing of wrath. The blood of Jesus Christ satisfies that. And so therefore, because of that, What are we then able to do? We are able to approach God in prayer and do so in boldness. Look with me at uh, Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4, beginning there in verse uh, 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we have not a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And so Jesus Christ is our access to the Father, John chapter 14 and verse 6, and is living to make intercession for us on our behalf in view of sin, in view of the accusations by Satan, and in view of the wages of that sin and our efforts to continuously strive to live faithful as we walk in the light, uh, being able to have access to His blood and the cleansing of that sin, 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7. And so His mission is continual. His mission is continual. The pre-existence means His timeline is infinite. He stands ready, point number two, to advocate for us. I've been thinking a lot of how to really position this, and I can't really think of a good way to do it other than to just say it. We're all familiar with John Foy, right? John Foy, the strong arm. Uh, We're all familiar with Ken Nugent. Ken Nugent. One call, that's all. Uh, We're familiar with these law firms and these law groups that are constantly reminding us of what it is they do regarding uh, car accidents, regarding insurance, work, uh, Morgan and Morgan, all of these law firms. What is their big pitch? Their big pitch is they are ready to fight for you. They're ready to fight against the insurance companies. They're ready to fight for the one that did the wrong in the context of the situation that brought about the harm. They're ready to advocate, and they stand waiting to receive our calls. We see billboards constantly. We hear radio commercials constantly. Uh, I think Hannah and I, certain television shows, I don't know if it's Google and YouTube or what it is, but for some reason we get bombarded with John Foy ads, like sometimes four ads in a row, back to back to back, hearing his uh, pitch in terms of what it is he's ready to do to fight on behalf of of uh, consumers. And so uh, you think about then advocacy and what advocacy is and these law firms and these law groups who are ready to advocate on behalf of those who have been harmed or are in need uh, to be fought for. Well, let's look at 1 John chapter uh, 1 and let's actually read here um, 1 John chapter 1 Ver, uh, ch- the whole chapter, and then we're going to get slowly there into chapter 2 and just read verse 1 of chapter 2. Uh, let's begin, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. John the Apostle is writing and says, we were in the presence of Christ. We were in the presence of Almighty God. Verse 2 of chapter 1, the life was manifest. And we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. That which we have seen 
and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. This is the message which we have heard from Him and declare to you that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ His Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us, my little children. These things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. John says, because of who it was they were in the presence of, because of who it was that they are in fellowship with, He's writing so that we might have fellowship with Him and thereby then have fellowship with God. And based upon that knowledge, based upon a life that then lives in the words as delivered by Almighty God, we are then able to have joy knowing that the wrath of God no longer is set to come upon us because of the satisfying of wrath as is accomplished via the blood of Christ. And that Jesus now stands advocating on our behalf. If we go to Him, if we go through Him to the Father confessing our sins. And so advocate there in chapter 2 and verse 1 comes from the Greek word parakletos, which means pleader of one's cause. It was used in a court of justice to denote a legal assistant. A counsel... For the defense. And so just like those law firms and all those commercials and billboards that we see, uh, Jesus stands ready. He stands ready. He is actively right now uh, able and waiting and ready to assist and aid man. Well, what does this mean for me? What does this mean for me? Well, number one, it, it is comforting to know that God is always there. God is always there. Uh, no matter what it is that I'm struggling through, no matter what it is that I might be um, painfully enduring, any temptation to leave God and to pursue outlets that are available here in this world uh, that will satisfy the, the fleshly and the physical circumstances are not worth it or needful because God is constantly, continually there. And the Hebrews writer writes about this in Hebrews chapter 13 and in verse 5. He writes, let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. What is the idea here? The idea is that uh, in a context where we are tempted to covet the status or situation of another, to pursue the state that they are in, to make that our God, to make that our focus, that is not needful because God still is available and ready to comfort us, never leaving us, never forsaking us. Notice also verse 6. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What can man do to me? Uh, God is always there. Uh, he is the God of all comfort. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verses 3 and 4, and that when I am afflicted, when I am going through pain, uh, when I am struggling, Jesus feels it. Jesus knows it. Jesus is in tune with it. And we have a great picture of this because of what was taking place in the first century. You might remember what we find there uh, in the book of Acts. Uh, concerning the uh, early church and what was taking place. And in particular, uh, we find there at the end of chapter 7 in Acts, they stoned Stephen, verse 59. Uh, he was calling on God. Um, and notice there in chapter 8 in verse 1, Saul was consenting to his death. 
At that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which is at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Notice then at chapter 9. Chapter 9, verse 1. Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now what's the connection to Jesus being persecuted here? Physically speaking, our Lord has already fulfilled the gospel. He's already died on the cross. He's already been buried. He's already rose again. Uh, Our Lord has already ascended into heaven. Acts chapter 1. And so how is it that Saul is persecuting the Lord? Well, let's back up here. Let's go to verse 1 again. Saul is still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. So if Jesus is saying he's being persecuted and Saul is persecuting the disciples of the Lord, how does Jesus view the disciples that are following after him? He views it personally. He's in tune with it. He's aware of it. He's engaged with it. He sees it. He feels it. He knows it's happening. Notice also chapter 8. Back up to chapter 8 and verse 1. Saul, once again, consenting to the death of Stephen. Referring to chapter 7, at that time, great persecution rose against the church. And so what do we find? The disciples are synonymous with the church. The church is synonymous with Jesus. Well, what part of Jesus? Well, the body of Jesus, of course. Ephesians chapter 1, last two verses of that chapter. And so uh, it means, as we think about Jesus always uh, still actively being engaged and Uh, in tune with us. His work is continuing. He's always there for us. He's available and ready to comfort us. And no matter what it is that we face, uh, He stands ready, even though He is all authoritative. Even though He is all authoritative. Um, Again, I'm just reflecting upon various situations that I have uh, been in at work. Uh, you all know that I'm in the operations world, and I can't tell you how many times I've been in an operations situation. Um, granted, there's great employees. This is not always the case. Um, but then, of course, there's always those employees that seem to rise the fastest to the top. Who, hey, now all of a sudden the work's shown up. Uh, I got something else going on. Uh, they're not in it to be in it with the team. They're not in it to be lockstep with the team. They're not seeking to always constantly be engaged with the team. Um, simply looking in regards to their authoritative position to accomplish whatever mission it is that they have and then be able to um, thrive and uh, glory in whatever outcome it was they were hoping to achieve. Not so with our Lord. He is continually, constantly, always, even right now, engaged. What a blessing it is. Uh, to know that. Maybe you're here this afternoon and you're not yet a child of God. Won't you make the decision to become one by putting on Christ via baptism? As we read about in Galatians chapter 3, 26 and 27, at that point, um, by being baptized into Christ, that is when you then put him on and are in him where all spiritual blessings exist. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3. If you've not yet done that this afternoon, won't you please make the decision to do so as you see exemplified in Acts 8, 34 through 39 based upon belief and confession in Christ. Brother or sister, if you have fallen away, if you need prayers of the congregation, uh, our Lord is our advocate. He is our intercessor. He is ready now 